Welcome to the LLS Tyleria presentation. Tyleria is a significant tick-borne disease affecting cattle in coastal areas. Outbreaks are also known to occur in non-coastal areas. There is no vaccine and no cure for Tyleria. However, there are ways that you can manage the disease going forward. This presentation is designed to give you the facts about tyleriosis in cattle, what the disease is, its life cycle, and how it is spread, and how you as a producer can reduce the impact on your cattle. If you have further questions after viewing this presentation, contact your local LLS district vet for advice and support. It's great being back here because I was raised in Tarawa. This particular parasite I've dealt with in my postdoc over in Kenya, which is a much more virulent one than the one we've got here. Uh, but for the last uh, eight years or so, we've been working on Tyleria orientalis. Um, it came in about 2006 and rapidly moved all the way down south coast across the country, over the WA and across the ditch into New Zealand. And now it's popped up in the USA so things might get a bit more moving over there. Um, what we've actually done is now uh, funded by MLA initially, all the research grants, and it's really important, I think, to be able to come to meetings like this, to be able to transfer the technology and the findings that we've got to try and make some sense and some relevant sorts of changes and, and suggestions to you about how you might deal with this disease and perhaps dispel a few other myths around um, Tyleria orientalis. So there I am, and in the diagnostics, this is this little parasite that sits inside and divides in the red cells that causes you all the trouble. So the structure of this presentation is pretty much following exactly what you wanted to find out uh, from that feedback that you gave us. And some of the things I'm going to talk about here is really try to transfer this research information into some control measures and options for control for your two groups of susceptible animals um, in this area. And they are, of course, as you well know, newborn calves and introduced stock from an endemic area. Okay, so we want to do a few basic facts about Toluria. I want to talk initially about the parasite itself so that we get a bit of a basic, you know, basic feel about it. I want to talk about the vector. Um, which is the bush tick, Haemophysalis longiformis. And then I want to look at that host parasite interaction. And then we'll talk about the disease in cattle, um, particularly around the seasonality, what it means, the progress of the disease, and what happens after that, and what it actually means for the control and why we actually have these two susceptible populations and nothing much else. And I also want to just stress some differences with Queensland cattle tick. Used to be called Bolophilus microplus, now just occurred to foil us all vets from different generations. It's called Rupercephalus australis uh, because a lot of the recommendations for tick control are made um, from Rupercephalus, from the Queensland cattle tick, and it's a different uh, kettle of fish entirely uh, for a three host tick like Demophysitis, like bush tick. Secondly, I want to transfer that technology. What have we found that's actually going to be useful for you um, to try and reduce the impact of this disease on your farms and your livestock? And thirdly, this integrated parasite management. What can we use in terms of chemical control and environmental control uh, to look at uh, controlling the impact of this disease? Now, I make this disclaimer, right? I'm a researcher. I don't have all the answers yet. Uh, but I'd also like to hear uh, from your questions, we may be able to eke out some more knowledge and I'll then sort of point out the way your research might go from here. But most of the research is particularly around the control of disease in the newborn cows. So, Tyleria orientalis is a protozoa parasite, okay? So protozoa just means it's very much like coccidia, it's very much like malaria, uh, let me get it to go overseas, um, and it's very much like Giardia. But those guys, Giardia and Coccidia, are gut, are gut protozoa. This one is a blood, right? A, a blood protozoan like Babesia, so tick, tick fevers in Queensland, and it lives in blood cells. The Babesia lives in only the red cells, but Tyleria, uh, the definition is it lives in both white cells and red cells. This one, 
Orientalis has got 11 genotypes, um, and that's for the molecular bonds that have found that out. But the two major ones that we're concerned with are things called Chitosi variant and, um, and Ikeda. Okay, so these variants are pretty much like these COVID variants we all hear about that we try to get immunised against. And then the third one is Buffali. Buffali is the one that's sort of been in Queensland for about 150 years. And the reason it hasn't been causing a problem is it's pretty benign, and we'll see why. These are the virulent guys that came here in 2006. These are the two of the virulent ones, and we'll see why they're virulent and why they're the problem. Okay, and then there's types four and eight and N1, but these three ones are the major ones. And type five, we have an assay called a, a polymerized chain reaction, the same one they used to diagnose your COVID. Right, it's a PCR assay, and those four genotypes are actually in the assay that we can detect. And I think we spent over $70,000 on assays um, during the course of this research. Right, the other thing, the reason why buffalo is pretty much benign in Queensland and doesn't actually occur too much down here is because the bush tick doesn't really vector um, Tileria orientalis buffalo very well at all. But it does very well for these two up here. Okay, so a little bit about the life cycle. This is a tick, protozoa, and cattle interaction. Okay, we call this, uh, what we call it is an indirect life cycle because it has an intermediate host and a final host. Now, the intermediate host is cattle. And in the, in the intermediate host, this parasite grows up. It undergoes what we call asexual reproduction. So it invades a red cell, and it divides, breaks the red cell open, goes into two. Then it, divi it, it divides again, right? And then it breaks that cell open, and then it goes into another two. So you're going two, four, eight, 16, up in lobs of two. And as it multiplies, of course, you get destruction of the red cells, but you also get proliferation of the parasite. So this is a sort of interaction between the two. And of course, the tick which comes in feeding is picking up these once they're circulating in the red cells because that's what it does, right? It's sucking blood. And in the tit, it goes from the gut, matures into the salivary gland, and then it, step, it undergoes its sexual reproduction. And that's important in the tick, and the tick is called the final host because of that, the final of the affinity fuzz. Because this sexual reproduction maintains, we reckon, maintains its virulence. So, a little bit about the bush tick. About five years ago, we were able to determine that Haemophysalis longer corners, the bush tick, was the actual um, competent vector for this particular parasite. Okay, now, this particular um, tick is what we call a three-host tick. So it's like paralysis tick for dogs, right? A larvae feeds on one host, then it falls, when it engorges, it falls off into the environment, and then it molts to the lymph stage. It's then picked up by another host where it feeds and falls off. And then it finds a third host where it develops to the adult stage in, in gorges and falls off and the female lays eggs in the grass. Okay, and they hatch into the adults for the next generation. Now it's interesting for this particular tick because we very rarely find males. And so it tends, seems to be hermaphroditic or part, part of the genesis, if you like. No, virgin births or something like that. Okay, so the female then drops off, lays the eggs in the grass, and then they, they hatch for around about probably February into the next generation. So what's it mean for infection? It means that if you want to transfer an infection between animals, right, all you've got to do is, is the infect in one host and then pick it up and inject in the next. Right, so the next stage is the stage that's infectious. But what it actually means is that for, because it can do this, it doesn't have to send the infection through the eggs, right? So what that means then, of course, is that the infection has to be picked up by the larva tick or the nymphal tick in the next generation, right? So it doesn't go through the egg. I contrast this with the Queensland cattle tick, which is called a one-host tick. So the larva, the lymphal, and the adult stages are all on the same animal. And it sits there for about 21 days. So one, it's easier to kill it because you've got 21 days to act. Um, secondly, 
We'll also know that your tick fevers, which take about 10 days to develop, are caused by this particular parasite um, and the ticks, because you can actually see ticks still on the animal, right, when the, when the clinical signs develop and the fevers develop. So the other thing is that you can't transfer the infection from one animal to another unless you send it through the egg right onto the grass. And that's how this one actually transfers the infection of Babesia. So that's a one host tick. The, egg, the infection goes through the eggs. And that, of course, you've got a whole lot of quality larvae around there that are all infected and so it can transfer Babesia. So Tyleria is a different story in the bush tick. And the other thing about the bush tick is it's not just restricted to cattle. Right? Dogs and roos, we know, will actually support the engorgement of any stage of this particular tick. So it doesn't have to feed on cattle as, as host one, two, and three. It can feed on roos as one, two, and three, if you like, or dogs as one, two, and three. So it can jump around the particular um, species on which it feeds. Now, that has got, of course, some implications for trying to rid the, rid the area or your paddocks of ticks and also for the transmission of the disease. And this tick only feeds for about three to seven days of each start part of its life cycle to become engorged. So you multiply seven by three and you get the one host tick, um, the cattle tick, which feeds for about 21 days through all its life cycle. This one's the same, except it drops off. And you'll probably know from your introductions or your neonatal calves that, you know, things start dying around about six to eight weeks after you bring them in. And so you may not actually see any ticks on the animal, but it's still suffering the clinical signs. Okay, so we keep that one in mind. Okay, so this is how it all goes, right? And to summarise, we've got, it doesn't go through the egg, right? Not through that way. So it has to be picked up from an infected cow, either as a larval or the lethal stage. And then it can affect another animal after the next molt. So if it, if it gets infected as a larvae, falls off in the environment and crawls back on another naive animal, of course it can transfer the infection to that naive animal. So it's only the nymphs and the adult ticks which can transfer infection. All right, we just need to keep that in mind. So only nymphs or adult ticks can infect when feeding. And the other thing about nymphs is they can hang around and be infected for six months or so. But this creates some of the problem to try to clear pastures on them. So the next thing is that we found out quite uh, fortuitously, unexpectedly, is if they're infected as a larvae from an infected cow, Lo and behold, they can actually feed on a roux as a second host and still retain that infection to infect another animal as an adult. So it can actually carry the infection of Tyleria through a molt. We didn't expect that, but that's another thing that this particular tick can do. So, and this particular parasite. So we need to be thinking about that in terms of our options for control. Okay, the other thing is that Tyleria needs a couple of days, right, to sort of mature the sporozoites once it starts feeding before it really starts to in inject them into the animal. Um, and so that's very much like paralysis tick, where it takes about two or three days for the adult female tick to gear up the genes and the production of the toxin that causes the paralysis. So if your treatments can cure ticks in 24 to 48 hours, then your infection will be greatly reduced. And we'll see what that actually means in terms of the parasite load that gets into an animal. Oh, a number of examples that we've got. So what's it all mean? Number one, the life cycle of the host parasite interaction determines the seasonality of the infection. But so usually we have down here in a seasonal um, infection of, uh, of uh, three host ticks, or just single host ticks, we've got, we've got a larval stage, uh, the eggs hatch around about February, the larval stages are crawling around about March, um, the nickel stages are the ones that over winter, and the adult ticks are around in the springtime. On um, the whole, what happens around the springtime? Well, of course, you've got your calves, um, which are actually um, being, being dropped. And so, as I said, 
the lymph stages and the adult stages are the ones that can infect. So you've actually got a population of ticks which are infected which can transfer that infection. So the other thing, of course, is in endemic zones, you have ticks all round. This is a really special place up and down the coast of New South Wales and Victoria where ticks can survive all year round and it actually mixes up this life cycle of it. So you've got all, st all sorts of stages around the whole year round. So just appreciate the fact that they are there because you may think that once you got through the spring and everything calms down and you haven't got any more cases, there's no ticks about, right? But there certainly is, and you can prove that very, very quickly by bringing in some from over the ranges, right, and bringing them into your area, and lo and behold, you'll certainly find there's infected ticks about. So that diminution in cases that you see probably during the, the after the late, late spring, when your calves are sort of through about, um, you know, a couple of months old, two to three months old, is due to the fact that they've survived that first peak of parasitemia, as we see, and have gone into the carrier state and everything goes quiet. And the only way that something else happens is if you bring some more susceptible animals in and then those ticks will jump on those and infect them. And they found you'll get the same thing again where about six weeks in, you're starting to get animals that are looking pretty sick. You're probably lucky in some stages because Orientalis only kills about mortality is about up to about 30% of animals that get infected, whereas the one I work with in Kenya, it kills about 80 to 90% of cattle. Um, so, the resident cattle go into a carrier state. The other thing about this, in terms of what's it all mean, the nymphs overwinter. And as I said, they remain infected for about six months. Uh, we've held them in the, in the fridge um, for six months and they're still fully infected at the end of it. Um, and so they stayed infected for that period, and so they're really hard to try and kill off um, with pasture spelling. They're much more difficult to kill off than worms are, for example. And as I said, bush ticks can actually carry an infection through the nymphal stage if they feed on a kangaroo um, and then transfer it to a cow as the adult parasite. And the other thing to remember in terms of pasture spelling is your beautifully cattle-free paddocks, such as they might be getting rid of, um, of the ticks, may be completely infested by these living roos coming out of the bush and sort of dropping ticks all over again. Okay, so keep that in mind about these alternate hosts that this particular parasite has. Okay, the disease. The disease is all about, that's called anemia or red cell loss. As I mentioned before, this parasite gets into the cells, it divides, and so you get the 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64 sort of exponential increase on a factor of 2 um, of the parasite as it divides, with us. that's what it does in the intermediate host. So we get anemia. Anemia just means that when you take your blood right from your animal and you spit it down into the centrifuge, you actually measure the amount of the red bit, which is the red cells, against the rest of it and get a percentage. Right? And that's full of packed cell volume. And the PCV or the packed cell volume is usually about 35. In cattle, 35, 40, something like that. If you go as low as about 10 or so, and animals will still survive with tolerium, but it's probably pretty chancy if they get below 15. When if you bleed them out, they just look like it's a bit of port wine or rosé. Okay? Because there's so much blood loss in there, you've got a, a sort of a coloration but then you've got a very low number of viable red cells and everything else spins off them, okay? They go down because they're, they're listless, they haven't got enough gas to get around to feed or to get uh, enthused by life. And then you get the fever because of the loss of the red cells and all the rest of these things are attributed back, right, to the loss of the red cells. One. And once you start to see it inside the host like this, right, in a blood smear, and you've got a pretty heavy load of parasites because you've got, in say, it's 1%. Okay, you have enter the nine red cells or so um, per mil in a cow. If you can see one in this and you say, it's okay, it's one in 100, then you've got over 10 to the seven, right? With 10, 10 million or so parasites spinning around inside. And that sort of percentage is measured as what's called a parasitemia, right? Parasites in the blood and as a percentage. 
Okay, you've all seen these, those of you who've had the unfortunate uh, problems of dealing with them, right? It's all about the loss of red cells, so everything goes yellow or white. Mucous membranes, it should be a beautiful pink. You've gone um, this colour, the eye colour. The animal goes down, the calves get aborted, um, and the whole thing falls apart and some of the animals may die. And there's no treatment around yet. It's really tender, loving care to try and nurse them through this. OK, a little bit more about disease transmission. And the make-home message here is that as soon as animals' calves are dropped or as soon as you bring the, in in the introductions in, the ticks jump on them and the infection starts from day zero. Day of arrival, day of birth, day of dropping. OK, um, we have a, oh, an old gas student in the audience here who did this work at Borigo. Um, and we can see here that when we actually sampled animals, right, around about um, from five weeks of age uh, over a sort of a carving period of, of um, eight weeks, right, we found for Ikeda, the virulent one, by five weeks of age, it already reached quite a high parasitemia, as we'll see, is quite clinically relevant. So they had to be infected uh, from day zero to get to this sort of level. OK, if we look at that, then it slowly declines with time onto past that sort of peak that we see around about six to eight weeks. We'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. OK, but if we look at the old benign buffalo, the first thing to notice with this is, of course, that, OK, the axes are different, right? The parasitosis with buffalo is about six to seven times lower than Ikeda gets to. And once this actually comes down around the carrier state here, it's about the same level of parasites as you get with the, with the non virulent one, the buffalo. So it's a lot slower and it doesn't reach the same level of parasitemia, which gives you an idea of the difference between the virulent genotypes and, and the benign ones. OK, this is basically how you see it. This is basically what's going on on your farm and in your animals um, after you do your introductions or you drop your calves. So either one, we get the infection starting from day zero. We generally get the highest peaks of parasitemia around about six to eight weeks of which your deaths start to appear. You virtually set your watch by it, unfortunately. OK, just depending on the season, because it depends on the level of tick challenge, and we'll get to that in a moment. What happens after that is that the level of parasitemia goes right down, and this establishes what we call the carrier state. The animals remain carriers for at least 30 months. We've tracked them down at Bansdale for 30 months of age, and then you get a bit sick of tracking them, but they're likely carriers for life. And this is the reason that they don't get reinfected each season because it's carrier state, somehow we don't know yet, right? We don't know everything. We don't know how this actually operates, but it seems to prevent the development of clinical disease with the, re, with the seasonal challenge with the ticks. So once they reach this carrier state, okay, they're pretty much protected. And I would say that from our studies that virtually all your cattle in your endemic zone that aren't showing clinical signs are actually carrier, which is why you see the, the conditions occur and the, the, the carnage occurring in the calves because they're naive and the introductions from areas which don't have tolerea. So as you see it, we need to get them through this first peak of parasitemia. We need to try and reduce that down. Okay, that's the major point where all the carnage occurs and then it sort of settles down. So as I said, if that carrier state seems to be able to protect them somehow um, against um, seasonal re-challenge with the tick. So they calm okay, they live on their farm okay. However, if you stick them in a truck and transport them for about seven hours or so, you can cause some recrudescence or what I call breakdown of that sort of um, carrier state and cause disease again. So you put them under severe stress, um, you can actually reignite the disease. But it needs to be you know, something like around about seven hours or so, uh, because animals broke down when they moved from Bega to, um, to uh, Barabari, and also from the coast up to Terry a number of years ago. And then, of course, that, that particular outbreak dies down because there's no bush ticks over there to complete the life cycle of the parasite, so it dies out. It needs both those bits. It needs the cow, it needs the um, 
um, the uh, parasite and the vector uh, to maintain the disease. We would got holes three, of course, on the coast, on Philippine. Right, so we get them through that first six to, six to nine week period. You'll notice here too that I'm, I've also mapped the, post, the Paxil volume. And you can see it goes down to around about 20 um, in these ones. We didn't lose any at that particular um, stage either. Right, so just to summarise this particular transmission and the life cycle. Right, we've got infection from ticks. Starts on day one, but of course tick infestation is going on all the way through. It's only feeding for five to seven days, and another lot come on, and another lot, and another lot, as far as the, um, the twain shall meet. Right? We get clinical signs and death around this peak of parasitemia, and then the carrier state is established with recovery, and then they're protected after that. Okay, so that's your sort of, that's your sort of life cycle with this parasite. Okay, once the carrier state is established, right, with recovery, everything's okay. They're protected against seasonal challenges unless you really, really stress them. Okay, a couple of more things on that. There is no colostrum immunity, right? There's very little evidence that this particular parasite is transmitted to the fetus um, in the pregnant animal. And there is no evidence whatsoever that there is any antibody-mediated immunity in colostrum. And in fact, colostrum may actually transfer the infection, which be a good thing, as I'll mention a little bit later. So you've got two fully susceptible populations within your farm, and of course you know those anyway. Oh, I'm not telling you anything. You've got calves, move on, and you've got introductions from over the ranges or somewhere else where the parasite um, is not endemic. Okay, so in terms of options, I just want to sort of introduce another particular concept, that everything is life is a biological sigmoid curve, right? The more you drink, the drunker you get, the more cigarettes you smoke, the more cancer you get, the more ticks you put on, the more clinical disease you're going to get. Right? So that's just the way it goes. It's a whole file of other things, but there's a dose here, and there is a response that you can measure, whether it be death, whether it be drunkenness or whatever. Okay, so there's that. Down here, okay, if you give strychnine at very low levels, it'll stimulate your appetite. You increase the dose, you die. So that's that sort of dose response effect, and we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about tick control and the, what we call the quantum of infection, right? The amount of the infective agent getting into the animals, which of course is vectored through the tick. So all the options for control at the moment are centred around trying to reduce the effects of the tick, or reduce the tick numbers or slow it down. Okay, so a few options and a few other little bits of pieces that fit into this. Firstly, all ticks and bloods collected from Dorigo, Milton, Stroud, Cabago, the cattle that we've actually sampled, have been positive for all of those genotypes in the PCR that we've got. So it might have a whole 11, we don't know, but they certainly have Aikida, they have Buckeye, they have Tetosi, and they have uh, type 5. So in endemic zones, pretty much everything's infected. And because everything's still a carrier state, right, all your animals, all your ticks feeding on them, they're going to get infected as well. So it becomes that sort of endemic cycle. So we're still dealing with our two susceptible populations. We know that between 6 and 50 um, infected bush ticks will actually induce our, our PCR positivity, which is pretty, pretty sensitive but it may not cause clinical disease, but we know that only a few numbers of ticks will actually cause an infection of an animal that we can detect. There'll need to be probably a lot more ticks on there and a rotating tick infestation to be able to get it to clinical signs, and that depends on the season, but we know that that sort of number can actually cause disease. So deaths will rely on how much tyleria actually gets injected over the period before they reach that um, maximum parasitemia at six weeks, okay, to get the high levels. There is no vaccine and it probably won't be made because it's not commercially viable. There is not a big enough market for it. The other thing is that bupavacline, BPQ, which we used over in Africa to treat um, uh, uh, tyleriosis over there, is not registered for use in Australia. New Zealand uses it and has a nine-month withdrawal period. So what we're trying to do 
is we are trying to slow down the infection by reducing tick challenge. Right? So the parasite levels roll as slowly and they don't get as high as they do if you get a big hit all at once. Right? So that's that quantum of infection bit about that dose response to them I talked about. So what happens? The parasite level, the peak parasite level is lower, which gives the animal more of a chance and doesn't get um, as sick. Um, and you get less production loss. And because it's dragged out, it gives the animal longer time to gain immunity. And immunity is not antibody. It tends to be what we call cell-mediated immunity. If you want, to, you want to knock off a virus or a parasite that lives in a cell, you need another cell to sort of kill it and recognise it and kill it. Right, so that's called cell-mediated immunity where it actually kills it. So the other thing is... If you want to gain immunity and maintain the red cell numbers, good nutrition certainly helps, and good nutrition can actually allow for the compensatory gain to cover any production loss caused during the initial onslaught. Okay, so good nutrition. We certainly found that at Dorigo, where we brought animals up in autumn, right, and they got sick, and then, of course, all the grass freezes over up in Dorigo, and you can't get much to eat, and so they have a greater production loss than if they are introduced uh, in, in spring, where well, they went through the same episode, but because they had good pasture up there, it always rains in Dorigo, um, then they are able to regain that weight loss from the compensatory gain. Once they get that, of course, as a couple of, uh, of studies have shown, you don't get any sort of uh, detriment to production if you're a carrier. Right? That's been shown in dairy cattle in, in Victoria, and in beef cattle in New Zealand, right? So once you're a carrier, you're still able to reduce quite effectively, and you're also protected from the parasite. So there's not a, not a, doesn't seem to be a discernible um, production check to be a carrier. So that's another reason for it uh, it be a sort of an ideal state in an endemic zone. Mind you, it certainly supports the parasite as well, because the ticks can still pick up the infection and maintain the whole thing. So what you think, it's basically a uh, uh, utopia for the, yeah, for the parasite, is to have this sort of a situation, but it also sort of benefits the animals that are in the endemic zone. Okay, as I said, once the animal reaches that carrier state, it's pretty much protected from seasonal challenge with the, with the tick, the parasite, and the compensatory gain can be regained um, from compensatory gain once the animal is well fed. And so what do we know that can actually now start to look at reducing these, the tick on swore? So this is important. Tick challenge is lower and slower in cooler months. Right, keep that in mind because we found this out when we moved animals to Dorigo um, and under normal circumstances when we moved them there, they'd all become positive around about four weeks. They'd reached their peak of parasitemia around about six to eight weeks, and if they survived, then they went into the carrier state. That is the normal sort of seasonal um, dynamics of the infection that we see. Okay, the maximum parasite levels reached about uh, under 200 million per microliter, um, and there's where the deaths occur, about 300, so we didn't quite reach that particular target, thank goodness, because I was doing the experiment on an industry farm, an actual producing farm, so I didn't want any deaths anyway. Okay, we had no deaths, but we did have that, um, that production loss, which when we moved them in September, we could regain. But if we moved them um, and they over, had to overwinter with limited nutrition, then they didn't actually regain that right through to sale. Okay, what happened last year? It was a really cold winter. It was a pretty cold spring. We didn't really get to any, any summer or spring weather until November. And what happened to my experiment up there is it just it, it went berserk but I was able to take um, some information from it because what happened was when the maximum temps in that year were two to three degrees lower um, than normal and maximum temps are the ones that are, that are good for ticks because that determines how much they can move. Okay, the tick infection was much slower. And instead of all cattle being infected by four weeks and with a maximum parasitemia at six weeks, Lo and behold, they weren't all infected for 12 weeks because the ticks were just slow. Okay, and the parasite levels were, was a startling 100 to 1,000 fold lower than what we get during a, what we call a normal season when there's lots of ticks around. 
So that, if we turn that around from a failed experiment, actually give us the indication that if you can actually slow the infection down, then you're not going to produce that high paracetamia and you're also not going to get any signs of clinical disease, which we didn't. Okay, so we had no deaths and no significant weight loss under those sort of conditions when that was lower and slower. So then you have to work out how are we going to lower and slower it down. And the other work that we did um, down at Milton was to trial something for calves because calves are the problem. You can sort of choose and, and move things about um, in terms of introductions, but it's much harder to do with your calves. And I'll explain that a little bit later why. And she had some very tractable um, uh, Angus down there that didn't charge you when you approached the calf. And she was able to slip in these python ear tags um, into the ears on the, on the day or two after birth, right? Keeping in mind that ticks are jumping on as soon as the calf hits the ground. Okay, so around about um, five weeks or so, there's quite a significant decline um, in the parasite, you know, level of parasites in the blood in those animals. Mind you, the controls were only about seven bulls that they wanted to get rid of. Um, otherwise, it's very difficult to justify only treating half the animals in the group. Okay, a little bit different around about eight weeks, and she could get to the, um, to the animals, to the calves, to give them what's called uh, Dexamax and the Doramectin. Um, and the injection uh, has a longer residual time than the poron. So it, it, in, in um, a one-host tick in Bolophilus uh, or Ripocephalus in Brazil uh, as well, it will kill larvae that attach for up to 28 days. So we'll keep killing them for a month. So it's got a, what we call a persistence period of around about a month if you give the injection. Now, mind you, I have to have a disclaimer here these are both what's called off-label, right? That means that you are not following the label that's, uh, that it is, uh, that's provided by the manufacturer, which means that if something goes wrong with something and you're following the label, the manufacturer has to deal with that, right? You get compensated. If you use stuff off-label, you're responsible, okay? So you just take your chances. So these, both these are off-label. The only reason for Dectamax, of course, is that it's registered for killing cattle tick, Queensland cattle tick, but it's not registered for bush tick. That's the only difference, right? And the good thing about this stuff is you can actually use it on weak old calves. But of course, then you've got the problem of trying to muster them, right? Particularly you booth guys um, and, and Miss Mulberry and all the other sort of razzmatazz that goes with it during a calving season. So, you know, the recommendation is try and get in as soon as you can and shot it in at seven weeks. But, of course, if you remember that trans transmission of the disease, right, the peak of the parasitemia is around about six to eight weeks, so this is getting too late. This is, a, this is the problem of this timing um, for this particular parasite in calves. Okay, um, a Parabos presentation by Matt last year listed a number of... Um, of actives which you can utilise, some of which are actually recommended for bush tick or there's some evidence. Um, there's been a number of handouts prepared which are probably far more informative for you here. Um, and they also mentioned for the not the Python tags, but certainly for the Dectamax, that it's off label if you do decide to use it. Okay, so there's a number of products out there which you can utilise. Okay, so let's look at now a sort of an integrated approach to reducing parasite numbers on pasture. All right, our pasture spelling is not as easy as Queensland because this is lovely tick country, as well you know. Winters are fine, no frosts, etc., And so the ticks survive and those nymphs are very, very hardy and resilient. And of course, there are plenty of other sort of hosts other than cattle um, for this particular tick. So just removing the cattle from your pasture doesn't ensure you that you're getting rid of the ticks as well if you've got rouge hopping over the fence and coming in to sample your pasture. Okay, but unless it's cleaned in autumn, right, when there's still a bit of heat around, or you might be able to graze it down before the rains and before sowing any winter pasture, maybe your oats or, or um, if you're sod seeding or something like that, winter spelling won't remove infected nymphs, right? They'll survive there quite happily. Summer spelling, 
And it's very much like smart grazing for sheep worms. Okay, you may actually treat cattle uh, with a with a ticicide uh, three days before putting them in and graze all the pasture down to expose anything that's left there, and then remove them um, when they've grazed it right down towards the end of the, um, the end of summer, before you your theoretical autumn break with the rain and pasture. I know this sounds all great in practice, but it's in theory, but I know and understand it is really difficult to do grazing management on farm um, during the changes and the variabilities in the season. Okay, but if you've got rules about popping over your back fence every night and, and spreading around, you're likely to have your pastures still infected no matter what sort of spelling you're doing and, um, and if you've got the ruse removed. I don't know about wombats or possums as to whether they actually act as um, alternative hosts for um, bush tick, but certainly I know that kangaroo is gene. Okay, a few more things about carving time, sites, timing of introductions, etc. Okay, so we talked about the fact that's lower and slower in, in the cooler months, right? The cylinder ticks are slowed down. So try to carve away from the bush. They tried this at Dorigo, away from the bush, because there's no doubt that your beef cows will secrete the calf away in the bush there. And I spent many a time along the River and Jeringo on there, sort of getting down in the tussocks and sort of blaring my head off, trying to get the cow to show me exactly where she'd put the calf. So try and carve them away from the bush or ruin-infested paddocks. Okay, try and spell those and keep them keep them away from immediate tick infestation. They tried this at Dorigo, carb earlier in the season, try to go for July, when the ticks might be even less sort of active, right, rather than having, a, um, uh, having them in perhaps August, September, when they're starting to warm up again. Uh, that's going to depend on bomb and land line, sort of predicting what it's going to do um, in the next three months or so. Introduce cattle from non area regions in the cooler months. Right, please try and stay away from, uh, from trucking in pregnant cows, particularly in the second half um, of gestation, uh, because of the stress of the, of the travel. But also, you know, they're going to, if you're going to bring them in for calving in spring, then they're going to be sort of right bang slap in the, in the uh, they've been calved already, and they're going to get tyleria from the first day that they arrive. And you're putting the stress on them um, as they get trucked in well. We try and get them pregnant a little bit earlier if you really want to adjust um, and get them carving down, um, bring them in perhaps May, May June or perhaps not at all. Just get your, get your bulls from over in the, in the, um, uh, the non-endemic areas and bring them in and do the job on, on the, in the endemic areas. Okay, you may try and keep them in a house paddock or something that you've actually spelled. Now here I'm thinking of, you know, really expensive bulls. Right, if you want to introduce some genetic diversity into your selection index, then you might want to uh, bring those in and try and keep them protected from it. Now, that's just the environmental bit of it, okay? Like I said, uh, don't, please try and avoid bringing them in in the second half of pregnancy because that's, that's the danger zone. Okay, hosts and tick numbers. All right, tick treatments. Okay, we've got tables and you've got handouts for those. And I won't add anything more on that except to say we really need some more research into the effects of some of the treatments on neonatal calves. Okay, that's something I did retire in June uh, from my uni job. Um, so it's sort of, that's one of those legacy and bits and pieces I never get to finish. And so I'm looking to the young and dynamic uh, to continue that on to provide you with that sort of information. Okay. Try and treat them with some of those acaricides either before you truck them or certainly on arrival, keeping in mind that the ticks are jumping on as soon as they get there. So it's probably best to try and do them um, before they're trucked. Right. Okay, keep in mind, as I said, stock are infected immediately, so start um, early. Okay, introduce stock, and I think Matt told, told you this um, a couple of, couple of years ago that you really need to treat them regularly um, to try and slow that, those number of ticks down, at least for the first three months. Okay, so then we sort of pass that sort of critical period of the first peak of parasitemia, and hopefully most of them have gone through the carrier state. You may want to bleed one or two and send it off to the MAI or so to get tested to see whether they have actually reached that carrier state. 
and to get an idea of the level of parasitemia in them. Five animals will do. Okay, calves. Calves are the major problem, uh, certainly for me anyway. It's more work, as I said, needed to try and work out what's the best procedure we can use um, to treat them as soon as possible after birth to try and reduce the tick numbers because they're getting nothing from mum that's going to protect them. Okay, we talked about the off-label off Dectamax, um, at least 28 days um, with the injection. The other problem with that, of course, is the calves are grown like stink. So you inject uh, a neonatal calf a couple of days after birth uh, with an injectable, it weighs so-and-so. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, it weighs double that. And so the concentration of the injectable in the persistence period is actually diluting out. So you just need to keep that in mind as well as to how fast they're actually growing. Okay, so that um, sort of finishes my little talk here, and I owe a heck of a lot of people, uh, and Meat and Livestock Australia, an awful lot of gratitude uh, for a lot of the work that was actually done um, on there's about nine vet students that actually did research projects on Toleria. So there should be a few of them out there that know what they're talking about, if I've done my job correctly. Love to say thank you to David. Thank you so much for giving us a talk and thank sharing you. your wisdom. Thanks for being a great audience and listening. No one actually fell asleep, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty pleased. Thank you.